Hi, I'm Bob Allison, WB1GCM, ARRL test engineer from the ARRL laboratory in Newington, Connecticut. I'm here in San Jose, California at the AMSAT Symposium, and with me is Lance Jenner, K6GSJ. And uh, hello, Lance. Uh, thank you for joining me here. Glad to see you, Bob. Now, in front of both of us is a prototype of Oscar 1. Oscar 1 was the first amateur satellite that was launched December 12, 1961. And this is actually the ARL's prototype. It was battery powered, three different 18 volt mercury batteries here. This is the uh, transmitting board. There's a keyer board down here. I'm not sure if it's out of sight or not. And a temperature sensing board. This satellite was uh, up in space, operating for 22 days. And about 700 amateurs around the world uh, actually heard this transmit at the time. It was the first non-military satellite that went up into space. And um, it uh, weighed a little bit under 10 pounds in the magnesium case. Lance is one of the builders of Oscar I, and we're really pleased to have him here uh, at the AMSAT Symposium. Now, uh, Lance, how did you uh, start out in ham radio? How did your interest in radio start? Well, I, I lived in the country, out a place called Lemon Cove, California, mm -hmm. out here by Salia, Fresno, mm -hmm. foothills of the Sequoia King Canyon National Park. And our nearest neighbor was a mile away. And my dad used to uh, take me to the dump when I was about nine or ten years old, mm. which uh, had a big truck, and we'd haul the stuff out to this big field, which was the <coughs> dump. And uh, there was a uh, older guy there that in a, in a shack and had a little wire cage where he had old radios he'd, he'd pulled out of the uh, trash pile. Mm. And uh, I'd buy one of these radios for 25 cents yeah. and take it home and yeah. tear it apart, mount these uh, all these little components, which I didn't know what they were, but mount them on a board and uh, to pretend I was building something. And mm. That morphed into lights and uh, buzzers and things like that, and yes. that's where my interest in electronics so started. Very good. And um, when were you uh, first licensed? 1954, I believe. Mm -hmm. Was that uh, one of the early novice licenses? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a KN6 license, and uh, I was mortified at the time because the K calls were just had just come in, and mm. I desperately wanted a W6 call, oh, otherwise right. I'd be just, oh, it was just, you know, almost embarrassing. And as the years went on, K6 calls became even more rare than W6 yes. since they uh, yes. uh, they re reissued them. Well, certainly. Now, could you say your amateur radio career in the early days led to your career in engineering? Oh, absolutely. Mm. No, no question about it. I was very lucky in that. From the time I went into high school, I, I knew what I wanted to do, and that isn't the case now for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, where did you attend college? I went to uh, Cal Poly, and then I also went to the place called College of the Sequoias in Visalia, California. Mm -hmm. Now, shortly after your college career, you actually got into rocketry, and uh, and you worked for, was it, was it uh, Lockheed? I started at Lockheed yeah. in 1960, and uh, Lockheed was up near Moffett Field here in Sunnyvale, California. And they were just building up to a huge company. And uh, I, just luck of the draw, came in at just the right time. Mm. And how did you get involved with Project Oscar? Um, in 1959, Don Stoner, W6TNS, uh, put a kind of a semi-humorous article in CQ magazine. Yes. <laughs> and uh, a group of uh, hams sort of took up the challenge. And I had, and two of them worked for Lockheed. And I happened ah. to uh, beat them while I was at Lockheed. And that was uh, Chuck Towns, uh, K6 uh, uh, LFH was the main one, main spark plug. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned about Oscar from them. And I uh, was really intrigued. and. I happen to be working on the satellites that would carry it. Amazing. <laughs> good, good timing. Yes. And um, your contributions to Project Oscar, what did you actually work on? There were many, many people involved, many talented people, engineers. Yeah. What actually uh, functions of Oscar one did you work on? 
Uh, I mainly did the integration of the electronics into the uh, uh, into the module and the integration onto the satellite. Oh, and uh, did all the the testing. Uh, we had another uh, Lockheed uh, person, Nick Marshall, W6OLO, worked at the Palo Alto Research Laboratories, and they had all the environmental test equipment we needed to qualify uh, mm -hmm. the Oscar satellite. So I spent uh, time up there, and um, where we take this newly made satellite and put it on fixtures and hit them with huge hammers and things like that. It was it was new to me and yeah, sure. it was very traumatic to, to, <laughs> to take this baby and just take this huge sledge with a shock test you know, like that and wink, swing this hammer back there and just knock the holy hell out of it. <laughs> I understand it had to withstand 50 G's. Yeah. And also quite a uh, severe temperature extremes as well. Right. Well, it was very, very successful, and uh, you went on uh, to work on other satellites as too. Yes. Of the early uh, Project Oscar satellites, uh, uh, you worked on Oscar two, and how, how was that different than the first Oscar? Uh, it was the everything was the same except we lowered the transmitter power slightly, put in more batteries, mm. and we also uh, fixed the temperature <laughs> profile. Uh, the Oscar one ran uh, about 50 degrees C, which was uh, way too hot. Yeah. And these were the early days when you started striping for thermal control and things like that, mm -hmm. and uh, things weren't well understood then. Certainly. And particularly, we foamed the entire unit there, so mm -hmm. the thermal engineer was looking at this, uh, just didn't know how to quite handle that. And uh, right. so, based on the temperature data we got from Oscar one, um, like I say, it ran around 50 degrees for about 288 orbits. Uh, Oscar II, we have a different pattern on uh, on it. And, and more stripes, it seemed. And more yeah. stripes, and uh, that temperature went from about 15 to a little over 20 degrees C, which was just oh, perfect. Yes. Uh, interestingly enough, our <laughs> prototype here, it's hard to see, but there are remnants of stripes here. And just a little story about uh, the prototype is after the Oscar I program was successful, uh, this traveled around the country from school to school, and at some point in time, someone covered it with aluminum foil to make it shinier. But underneath this, uh, it would be uh, kind of a silvery color with uh, gold striping, uh, like the original. Uh, other Oscar uh, satellites, you went on to work with three and uh, Oscar three, yeah. yeah. And did that one actually reach space? Yes, o Oscar III was uh, very successful. This was a uh, in-band uh, linear translator. Oh, uh, very, very first, very first one. Uh, even uh, commercially, there wasn't wasn't anything like that. Anything like it? No, that's a, quite a technical challenge. And I was trying to remember why we chose, why we didn't do a cross-band repeater, and I can't remember the exact details except that it didn't appear to be legal at the time. Ah. So uh, we decided to do a two-meter in-band translator, mm -hmm. and that is damn hard. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but it worked. Yeah, it worked. Great. And you went on to work on uh, satellites, uh, Oscar uh, 6 and 7? Uh, well, I, I worked on, uh, on uh, Oscar 4. I, yep. I did the coordination with uh, TRW mm -hmm. and the integration on the Titan 3C in Florida. And then I, uh, Oscar Five, I, uh, the Australian group contacted University of Melbourne and uh, sent Oscar a letter, says we want to build a satellite. And so the task came to me. And so I have a huge correspondence file where we build a satellite by, by, uh, by letter. Wow. <laughs> this is before internet. <laughs> wow, yes. And uh, they delivered, and we lo by then lost our launch opportunities. Mm. And then uh, AMSAT came to the rescue, and uh, which was brand new at the time. Yeah, which yeah. was brand new and formed almost to kind of t trying to find other launch opportunities because we were all military up until that time, and now wanted to get NASA into the into the mix. Very good. Uh, anything else you'd like to add about your amateur satellite career? Well, I I spent I spent very little time operating through the satellites, <laughs> and almost all of it uh, either building or being affiliated. I loved my affiliation with uh, Jan King and uh, Perry Klein and the AMSAT group. And mm. I furnished a lot of uh, space-grade parts uh, to them for future satellites. 
and I think they still have uh, some stock. Very, very, very good. And uh, are you still active on the bands today? Uh, yes, mainly uh, uh, FM repeater systems. I maintain uh, several repeater systems on local mountaintops, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, uh, active in the amateur microwave. Very good. Well, uh, Lance Jenner, thank you very much for joining oh, me here welcome. at the AMSAT Symposium. <laughs> It's pretty it's been a pleasure. great to talk to you, and here you are reunited with one of your yeah. prototypes. That's really cool. Yeah. After 50 years, it still <laughs> looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, it's a little beat up. I think you've aged better than the, oh, uh, than the old bird here. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm Bob Allison, WB1GCM uh, from the ARL Laboratory, and uh, thank you very much for joining us for this fine interview.